Welcome everybody, in this video we're going to cover the adapter pattern. I think it is more known as the wrapper rather than an adapter. And the reason it's called an adapter or a wrapper is because usually you take some kind of dependency that might change in the future and you wrap it in your own logic to make it fit into your whole business use case or your own mental model. You're taking that thing that is very generic and you're adapting it to your solution, okay? And generally that is done by wrapping it in some kind of object that fits your use case, right? So that, that, that's the general thinking about it. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at how can you spot where to use this pattern, right? So here I have two business logic simulators. We have employee fired, something happens to Bitcoin, right? So we're monitoring the stock market, whatnot. Something happens, we send an event to the user that subscribed to our events. We have a paid service and we provide the best Bitcoin information. We then have uh, the employee fired event, right? So internal business uh, logic, uh, some employee gets fired. Somebody has to go and uh, change a record in a database or like click a button on screen and, like this guy is fired. He gets an email with a settlement. I don't know how the firing, I've never been fired. But more or less you get the picture. Our third party dependency in this case is the send grid client, all right? So a third party dependency does not have to be a library. If you don't know what SendGrid is, by the way, it's an email service provider. So if you need to send emails to anybody from your application, uh, this is a very good option to go with. But coming back to wrapping dependencies, it doesn't have to be an actual third party library. It can be, it can be part of the standard library. And by start, standard library, I mean things that come from the system namespace. So if we use an HTTP client, that is still a very, very generic dependency that can be fitted anywhere, right? However, we have our business model, our business use case, which we've thought up, and the HTTP client doesn't really fit into it. And the reason it doesn't fit into it is if I have my business model and I go talk to a business person, he will never say, oh yeah, use a, make an HTTP request to the email service. No, he's just going to say, send an email to this user. He doesn't know what an HTTP call is, right? And he shouldn't know. And that is how you generally can figure out if something is a third party dependency, if it's generic enough to not actually be known by the business side of things. So non-technical people, generally you want to write a wrapper around it because as a ge generic thing, it is subject to change. Okay. And maybe we might want to swap it out later on as well. Maybe we're going to use some other email service, right? So let's look for some symptoms. And if you watched the factory pattern video, you're going to find this symptom very familiar. Generally, this symptom can be abstracted into many different patterns, depending on uh, its severity and uh, what its actual behavior is, right? In our case, we're injecting some kind of third party dependency right here to do something, right? We're not creating an object during the factory design pattern. If we are creating the same kind of object in different places, right? So the creation of the object is littered all over our application. If we have to change the way that that object is created, we have to go and find each of these places and change it in all of them. Factory design pattern allows us to take all of those places and put it into one factory, right? So if that process ever changes, we go and change the factory. Same principle here. Currently, we have this third party dependency littered across our application. So we want to go ahead, grab all these dots and put them in a wrapper or an adapter and hide the actual third party dependency language like send grid client and send email send grid message behind an interface, which the business side understands. So in our case, I create an interface, I user notification service and notify user. Okay. So if the business side says something happens, we want to notify the user, doesn't matter how email, push notification, browser notification, whatever they're subscribed to, just try to notify the user if we can. That's the language that they use. That is what we have here. So what you do, you take your iNotification service, we go and replace our send grid client with the user notification service. Uh, I'm not gonna type this out properly because I don't really uh, want to. So let me just quickly check this. Notify user and... Uh, there we go. Well, that's actually just put this here, right? Don't need to proxy that method, but yeah. Other work happens there. We pretty much just go ahead and uh, copy whatever is happening here into this Bitcoin event. And hopefully you get the picture. Now this uh, iNotification service is go going to have to include the SendGrid client. So if we swap out the SendGrid client for anything, 
the implementation of the iUser notification service is going to change, right? So that would be the implementation of the wrapper, and we're just gonna, I'm just going to fix this because pedantic reasons, and uh, then we're going to take a look at the other thing, right? And if you're wondering why we're using Visual Studio, because I thought it was going to be a little bit easier to understand in the concept of like a Visual Studio project where you have objects, business logic and whatnot. But anyway, again, so our business logic now depends on an interface. We have a contract, which if the business side says emails are broken, we actually know, all right, okay, uh, it must be something wrong with the email interface, which interacts with whatever email service we have implemented. Uh, this interface will then have to be implemented. The two ways of creating an adapter that are described in the designs patterns books is a class adapter and an object adapter. The two main differences between these two adapters is that the object adapter takes in the adaptee or whatever we're adapting, that generic thing, in the constructor. And then we maintain a pointer to it and we invoke whatever functions into it. Uh, the class adapter, rather than receiving the thing and pointing to it, uh, inherits the thing. So it becomes that thing and just and still just hides behind the interface. Uh, there are trade-offs uh, using both of the things. So for example, if we extend the SendGrid client and if your third-party dependency has a lot of methods to override, we get a lot of customization within the class adapter. So we can extend that client, we can put middleware in there if it doesn't let us do it by default, it becomes very easy to extend it. So if you need that, go with this approach. But generally, I would say that I always default to this one because here, what you do is you supply the send grid client. So this is a question between inheritance and composition. And for me, inheritance also always means structure. Composition means flexibility. This does mean a little bit more code. If you do notice the send grid client here, we can actually take our class that we are overriding the send grid client and we can just supply it in the object adapter. We cannot, however, reliably change the send grid client inheritance. So if we create something else to inherit from the send grid client, it might not be safe to just substitute it here and a bunch of other things can break. So you lack flexibility in changing this class adapter in the future of send grid client changes. However, this is less code and you actually get customization over the send grid client through overriding virtual and abstract methods. With object adapter, you accept some kind of interface or abstraction in the constructor. It doesn't have to be an abstract class, but just understand that you can already subclass that from the outside and kind of inject that into your object adapter, right? So this is for me ultimate flexibility, although a little bit more code and the adapter, the wrapper itself, cannot perform the kind of extension on the send grid client that the class adapter can. But I don't think that's a downside. The primary reason here that we want to do this is composability through putting it into the constructor. And I would say always choose the object adapter approach because I think composability is a lot more preferable. But here it is, uh, again, not too much to the adapter or wrapper design pattern. It's one of the more straightforward ones. Spot a generic dependency in your code. Decide how troublesome it's going to be if it changes. Locate all the places where it's currently present in your code. Aggregate it into the adapter and hide it behind an interface. That's it. Now, I thought it was worth showing how you can apply the adapter thinking to a microservices scenario. Even if you don't work in a cloud environment, you could probably benefit from this. So let's say we have three services that are maintained by separate teams and all three of them need to send emails. What you can do is you can take the send grid library and import it into the project of all three of these services. And then all three of these services will call the SendGrid API directly. Now, there are a couple of problems here, so I will just outline a couple. Let's say this service needs a new feature. Uh, they implement it and everything works for them here. Now, this service needs a feature. They implement it and the implementation that this team has done here may have broken something for this service that they didn't know, right? So in addition to implementing their feature, they onboard the feature that this team has developed as well, right? So it goes into here and then it gets updated. You would think this is simple enough to not happen, but it does. The more prominent problem is that what you have in a cloud environment is an internal private network, kind of like companies have, but in the cloud, right? 
So these servers would not be able to talk with each other. They would exist in different networks. And for them to communicate with the SendGrid server, they would need firewall rules to be set up in order to allow this communication with the SendGrid server, right? So there is way more communication going outside. And then there's a whole minutia around retrying emails. What if something fails? What if the email fails? Box gets killed because it is a preemptible one because it costs less. You know, all kinds of things can happen. So what you generally do is, again, you create a wrapper. You take the SendGrid library and you create a separate service, right? You have a code base, which you split into two. The first part is for your web API, where you have your additional service, where now it lives on the, VP, on the internal network of the cloud and uh, your service is targeted. And then there is only one outgoing source of network. The other part of the project is going to be this library, which is then added as a dependency to these services. And if any of these now needs a feature, they don't necessarily need to upgrade any of these services. Depending on how the release times look, it might be very hard to release this component. This component may be very easy to release so now they don't need to stress about releasing this hard component because it's legacy and whatnot. All they need to do is just update this service here, right? Let's say some configuration breaks on the send grid part. We no longer need to update the configuration of these services that target the send grid. All we need to do is just redeploy or change the configuration on the email service. And however many other services need to send emails within your business, all target the internal email service. Whoa, hold up. Look, this is the stuff I used to torture myself on the weekends. Now, it takes time to digest this and package it up into these videos. So if you did enjoy the content, please like, subscribe if you want to see more, uh, leave a comment if you have any questions. And if you want to be part of the community that I'm building, make sure to join my Discord server. I also stream on Twitch Wednesdays and Sundays, 6 o'clock London time. I have also opened up a merch store. So if you do want to support me, don't just donate, buy from there. Links to all of that and my other social media are in the description. Hope to see you again and have a good day.